In this video, we take a close look at DNS and private endpoints in Azure. Hello everyone, I'm Travis and this is Seraltos. So you want to deploy private endpoints for services like Azure SQL, Key Vault, or storage accounts. Good call. It adds security by limiting access from only the virtual network. But we need to access private endpoints by a fully qualified domain name. That is where things get a little tricky. Hold on. Before we go any further, please like, subscribe, and all that good stuff. It helps my channel and is greatly appreciated. If you like learning, check out my course on Azure Virtual Desktop and Azure Hybrid Identities on Udemy.com. And I have merch and a join option. Check below for the deets. Let's get started with a quick overview of how private endpoints work. Take a service that's typically available on the public internet, a storage account, for example. With private endpoints, a virtual network interface card, or NIC, is added to the subnet. That gets a private IP address, and now we can access that resource the same as other resources on the private virtual network. Let's jump into the portal and take a look at setting up a storage account with a private endpoint. Here we are in the portal. Let's zip through this for the sake of brevity. We'll give it a resource group. Give the storage account a name, and this will be in central US. Leave it as standard and local redundant. We'll go to networking next. And here's where we'll set the private endpoint. We'll add a private endpoint. We can leave the subscription and the resource group as is, as well as the location. We'll give it the storage account name with PEP at the end, or private endpoint. Now we have to set a sub resource. We'll set file for this example. But no, we need to create a new private endpoint for each sub resource we want to set up. So if we wanted a private endpoint for blob storage as well as table, we would have to go through these steps for each of those. I guess the point is that a private endpoint is not specifically bound to an entire storage account, but one of the services on that storage account. We'll select a virtual network as well as a subnet. Also, leave it to integrate with private DNS zones. This step is important for the rest of the video. Click OK. You can fill out the rest as needed. I'm going to go straight to review and create. And once validation passes, create. This will take a minute or two. I'll pause here and come back once it's finished. All right, that created. Let's go to the resource. Next, let's check to see if public access is available. We'll go to networking. And make sure that selected networks is enabled, but no networks are selected. What this does is it enables the firewall, and because we haven't selected any networks that are allowed to connect to the storage account, nothing will be able to connect to the storage account. Perfect. Now access is only available from the private IP address. One problem, DNS. Let's find the fully qualified domain name and the private endpoint IP address next. From networking, we'll go to private endpoint connections. Select the private endpoint. And go to DNS configuration. That's a lot of clicking to find this information. Here we have the private IP address and the fully qualified domain name. We'll need this information coming up. I'm going to spare you from me attempting to connect and having it fail because the host name resolves to an external IP address. We'll just jump into NS lookup and review the issue there. Let's get a quick overview of how this is set up because I don't think it's that uncommon. I'm not using the default DNS settings. If you're using the default DNS settings, you may have no issue accessing a private endpoint. This example is a hybrid configuration with Windows AD. I have domain controllers in Azure and the VNet settings have custom DNS set to the domain controllers. Let's take a look. This is a computer on the same VNet as the private endpoint we just created. Now if we use NSLOOKUP to try to hit the fully qualified domain name for the storage account, it comes back with the public IP. And to recap, NSLOOKUP is a tool for querying DNS. It has some other great features. For now, we just need to give it the host name and see what comes back. We lock down public access to the storage account, so trying to connect to it with a public IP address won't work. We need the response to come back with a private IP, not the public IP. Notice also two aliases. One of them is the fully qualified domain name from the storage account, and the other is for a private link. Hmm, wonder what that's for. Well, this will be important in a couple steps. 
the issue comes down to name resolution or DNS, as it often does. Let's look at some options for fixing this. We could simply update the local host file on every computer that needs to access the storage account, as well as any other resource deployed with private endpoints in the future. Just kidding, that would be horrible. Fine for a quick test, but not a production solution. The next option is a conditional forwarder. And before we get into that, let's talk about the wire server IP. I did a video on this a while ago. I'll have a card above and some information below. You'll be able to find it. The wire server is the IP 168.63.129.16. It's a public IP that's available from every VNet and only on the VNets in Azure. It's a public IP, so it won't overlap with any private IPs, but it's only available from inside an Azure VNet. The wire server data is unique to each VNet. The wire server does a few things. One of them is act as a DNS endpoint for the VNet, including private endpoints on that VNet. We'll take a look next. Let's run the same query with NSLOOKUP. We'll provide the DNS server to use for the lookup, the wire server IP for this example. That comes back with the internal IP address. That's the response we're looking for. Now, how can we use this in the existing environment? Now that we know the wire server IP has the correct response, we can use something in Windows DNS called conditional forwarders. Typical DNS works like this. The client asks for the IP of a host like www.seraltos.com. The DNS server looks to see if it knows the answer. And if not, a lookup is done based on root servers or forwarders to find the IP address and returns that to the client. A little simplified, but good enough for this example. Conditional forwarders tell the DNS server, if something asks for this specific domain, send the request to another server to figure it out. That other server for this example is the wire server IP. Let's set up a conditional forwarder on the domain controller. And just to be clear, because this will be important shortly, this domain controller is also a DNS server, is on the same VNet as the private endpoint. Here we are in Windows AD DNS. Let's add a conditional forwarder. The domain is file.core.windows.net. And as I've said before, if we were doing blob storage, it would have to be blob.core.windows.net, Cosmos DB, Azure SQL. These will all have different domain names. And we'll have to go through this process for each of those. So if any query comes in for file.core.windows.net, that query will be forwarded to the IP address of 168.63.129.16, which is the wire server IP address. And for this example, we'll store it with Active Directory. With the setting, the changes we're making here will be replicated to all of the domain controllers and DNS servers in the domain. Let's go back into the command prompt. From here, we'll run nslookup again, but let's first run ipconfig flush DNS. That removes any cache DNS entries, so we'll get new results. Now we'll run nslookup, and we'll pass in the fully qualified domain name for the file share on the storage account. Like magic, it works. Our DNS servers are passing that query off to the wire server IP address which is returning the local IP address for that private endpoint. But don't celebrate quite yet. I have another VNet configured with the same DNS settings and the same domain. Let's take a look at that. Here we are on a different computer. And again, this is on a different VNet. The VNet has its own DNS server, but that DNS server is configured the same. It's part of the same domain. So it has the exact same configurations with the conditional forwarder as the one we're just looking at. So now if we run the same nslookup command, we don't get a response. Let's take a look at the DNS settings. Just like the other server, this DNS server is set with a conditional forwarder to the file.core.windows.net set to the wire server IP address. So why did it fail? Because the information for the wire server is unique to each VNet. The second VNet doesn't have CIR VNet 1 test 111 as a private endpoint, so it can't give a response. Matter of fact, I do have another private endpoint on this VNet. Let's run nslookup with that. And again, this private endpoint and storage account 
are on the same VNet as the DNS server and the machine we're on. We get a name resolution for this private endpoint on this VNet. Let's hop over to the other VNet and do the same thing. Here we are back on the first VM and the first VNet. And remember, this one could look up the CIR VNet 1 test 111. Let's run the test again with a private endpoint and subnet that's on a different VNet. And it's unknown. With conditional forwarders, we can only do a name resolution if the DNS server and client doing the lookup are on the same VNet. That may not be a showstopper for your organization. For example, if you're using Azure Virtual Desktop and FSLogix profile containers on the same VNet, that may be fine. All access is from a session host on the same VNet. But what if we need to access the private endpoint from another VNet or from an on-premises server over VPN or Express Route? In that case, we're left with forward lookup zones. Let's take a look at forward lookup zones now. There are some manual steps with this option, but it will work with private endpoints at different VNets and on-premises servers. A forward lookup zone is simply a zone that the DNS server, the domain controller for this example, has authority for. We'll create a new zone on the internal domain controllers for the private link.file.core.windows.net domain and add our private endpoints to that. An important thing to consider with this setup, we'll always access the endpoint with the name.file.core.net fully qualified domain name. Remember earlier when we ran NS lookup and one of the aliases returned was the storage account name.privatelink.file.core.windows.net? Now that our DNS server has a forward lookup zone for the privatelink.file.core.windows.net domain, our DNS servers will return the host we add to that domain. Let's see how it's done. Here we are on the domain controller. This was the one in the first VNet, although it really doesn't matter. I removed the conditional forwarder that we set up previously. It just takes some time for that to replicate. And that reminds me, if you are following along, make sure you give DNS time to replicate these changes. For this example, I have a domain controller with DNS in both of the VNets. I have to make sure that that replicates between them before I go through these examples. So next, we're going to create a new forward lookup zone. But for this, we're going to use the zone privatelink.file.core.windows.net. We only add the private link domain. This way, non-private link file shares will resolve to the external IP. If we just put file.core.windows.net as a domain name, we would have to add every storage account we create into that domain. Remember earlier when we did the NS lookup and it returned both the file.core.windows.net and the private link.file.core.windows.net alias? This is where that's important. So we'll create a new forward lookup zone. We'll do a primary zone. And I do want it to replicate to all the DNS servers in the domain. We'll provide that name, privatelink.file.core.windows.net. We can leave this as a default and finish. Now for the manual step, we have to add the host name and private IP address for each storage account with private links enabled. And this has to be done every time we add a new private link, or we should remove them if we remove private links. So we'll add a new A host name. We'll add our first storage account. And notice the fully qualified domain name is the storage account name.privatelink.file.core.windows.net. And for the IP address, it's 10.0.0.6. Add host. Remember in the previous example, I created another storage account on a different VNet. So let's add that next. So that was CIR VNet 2 test 222. And the IP address for that was 10.10.0.9. And we'll add that next. Now, as we're waiting for that to replicate to the other domain controllers, let's go back to NS lookup on this machine. Okay, here we are. And you can see the previous attempts, we were able to resolve the CIR VNet 1 test 111, but we weren't able to resolve a CIR VNet 2 test 222. Let's try the first one. Okay, that resolves. Great. We expected that, though. Let's do uh, VNet2. And that resolves as well. So that's good. Although we had to manually enter in those host names, we're able to resolve those host names on a computer outside of the VNet. Let's check for the same results on the second VNet. Okay, here we are back on the second computer. And again, this is on a different VNet. 
Let's just make sure our DNS is updated. Yep, there's the private link zone. Okay, first let's run an NS lookup on the CIR VNet2 test222. And that resolved as expected, that did before. And now let's try the CIR VNet1 test111. And that resolved as well. That's good with this configuration, although we have to manually enter in those host names, our internal DNS will resolve the private link fully qualified domain names. It does that by leveraging the private link alias that comes back when we do a query. And also in this configuration, because we're only adding the private link domain to our internal DNS, it won't affect any connection strings that rely on external connectivity. For example, if we run NSLOOKUP on another account that doesn't have private links, we'll get the public IP address back. And again, this account has no private link enabled. With this configuration, we'll resolve the private endpoints to our internal IP addresses, but any storage accounts without a private link will resolve to the external IP address. The downside is if a storage account has a private link, but you haven't added the host to the internal DNS, the lookup will fail. Those are the options for DNS and a private endpoint. A conditional forwarder is fine if the private endpoint is only accessed from the DNS server on the same VNet. If access is needed from on-premises or other VNets, a forward lookup zone for the private link domain is the better option. Also, with the forward lookup zone, each new private link host will need to be manually added to the private link domain in DNS and removed if the private link is removed. I hope this helps you better understand options with private endpoints in DNS. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.